Um, given the, the weaknesses that you're describing, both in Europe but also in Southern Asia and, and likely in, in uh, East Asia itself, is it appropriate or even practical for us to be continuing to push the, the boundaries of the American empire, if you will, uh, to the edges beyond the areas of those kinds of um, internal problems? The United States has a fundamental interest. It controls all the oceans of the world. No power has ever done that. Because of that, we get to invade people and they don't get to invade us. It's a very nice thing. Maintaining control of the sea and control of space is the foundation of our power. The best way to defeat an enemy fleet is to not let it be built. The way the British managed to make certain that no European power could build a fleet was to make sure the Europeans were at each other's throats. The policy that I would recommend is the one that Ronald Reagan adopted toward Iran and Iraq. He funded both sides so they would fight each other and not fight us. This was cynical, it was certainly not moral, it worked, and this is the point. The United States cannot occupy Eurasia. The moment the first boot sets the ground, the demographic differential is we are totally outnumbered. We can defeat an army, we cannot occupy Iraq. The idea that 130,000 men would occupy a country of 25 million well, the ratio in New York of cops to citizens was greater than we had deployed in Iraq. So we don't have the ability to go across, but we do have the ability to first support various contending powers so they concentrate in themselves with political support, some economic support, military support, advisors, and in extremis, do what we did in Japan in uh, Vietnam, in Iraq, and in Afghanistan. Spoiling attacks. The spoiling attack is not intended to defeat the enemy. It's intended to throw him off balance. What we did in each of these wars, in Afghanistan, for example, is we threw Al-Qaeda off balance. The problem we have, since we're young and stupid, is that having thrown them off balance, instead of saying, okay, job well done, let's go home, we said, well, that was easy. Why don't we build a democracy here? <laughs> this was the moment of dementia <laughs> that came in. The answer, therefore, is the United States cannot constantly be intervening throughout Eurasia. It must be selectively intervening and very rarely. That is the extreme moment. We cannot, as the first step, send American troops. And when we send American troops, we have to clearly understand what the mission is, limit it to that, and not develop all sorts of psychotic fantasies. So hopefully we've learned that this time. It takes a while for kids to learn lessons. But I think you're absolutely right. We cannot, as an empire, do that. Britain didn't occupy India. It took various Indian states and turned them against each other and provided some British officers for an Indian army. The Romans did not send vast armies out there. It placed kings like, um, you know, various kings created under the emperor, and those kings were responsible for maintaining the peace. Pontius Pilate was an example. So empires that are directly governed by the Empire, like the Nazi empire, fail. No one has that much power. You have to have a level of, of cleverness. However, our problem is not yet that. It is actually admitting that we have an empire. So we haven't even gotten to that point where we don't think we can kind of go home and it'll be over and done. And so we're, we're not even ready for chapter three of the book. Is it in the U.S. interest um, to dispense with Russia as a European power? Could I? I didn't hear you. I think. Is it in a Euro, Is it in the U.S. interest to dispense with Russia as a European power? With Russia as a European power? 
Yes, I, I'm, I'm just curious, how do you foresee the architecture once it implodes? What will happen? It's a frightening scenario. Can you tell us a bit more? Well, remember the structure of Europe. From St. Petersburg to Rostov, you draw a line. To the west of it is the European Peninsula. To the east is Russia. No one has ever permanently occupied Russia. But Russia has always moved westward. Now it's its furthest point east. The line, incidentally, is roughly the border of the Baltics, Belarus, and Ukraine. The question on the table for the Russians is, will they retain a buffer zone that's at least neutral? Or will the West penetrate so far into Ukraine that they're 70 miles away from Stalingrad and 300 miles away from Moscow? For Russia, the status of Ukraine is an existential threat. And the Russians cannot let go. For the United States, in the event that Russia holds onto the Ukraine, where will it stop? Therefore, it's not an accident that General Hodges, who's been appointed to be blamed for all of this, uh, is talking about prepositioning troops in Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, and the Baltics. This is the intermarium, the from the Black Sea to the Baltic that Pilsudski dreamt of. This is, this is the solution for the United States. The issue to which we don't have the answer is what will Germany do? So the real wild card in Europe is that as the United States builds this cordon sanitaire, not in Ukraine, but to the West, and the Russians try to figure out how to leverage the Ukrainians out, we don't know the German position. Germany is in a very peculiar position. Its former uh, chancellor, Gerhard Schroeder, is on the board of Gazprom. Uh, they have a very complex relationship to the Russians. The Germans themselves don't know what to do. They must export. The Russians can't take up the export. On the other hand, if they lose the free trade zone, they need to build something different. For the United States, the primordial fear is Russian capital, Russian technology, I mean, German technology and German capital, Russian uh, natural resources, uh, Russian manpower as the only combination that has for centuries scared the hell out of the United States. So how does this play out? Well, the U.S. has already put its cards on the table. It is the line from the Baltics to the Black Sea. For the Russians, their cards have always been on the table. They must have at least a neutral Ukraine, not a pro-Western Ukraine. Belarus is another question. Now, whoever can tell me what the Germans are going to do is going to tell me about the next 20 years of history. But unfortunately, the Germans haven't made up their mind. And this is the problem of Germany always. Enormously economically powerful, geopolitically very fragile, and never quite knowing how to reconcile the two. Ever since 1871, this has been the German question, the pure question of Europe. So to answer my faithful colleague of 700 years of empire, where Hungary and Croatia was joined, I didn't think you enjoyed that that much. <laughs> um, think about the German question, because now it's coming up again. That's the next question that we have to address. And we don't know how to address it. We don't know what they're going to do. And thank you for your, um, for your analysis. Very much appreciated. If you are in Ukraine right now, and you're the U Ukrainian government, and, or, or the, let's take it past the government, but the people. And technically, the people should be the government, but that's a whole different issue at, at points in time. What do you do? Do you look to Europe, who, uh, whom, who has been criticized by Putin himself as the scourge of the earth, or do you look to yourself? Where do you look? What's next for Ukraine? Well, the first question you ask yourself, are you a Ukrainian speaker or a Russian speaker? Because Ukraine contains both. And while the idea of the Russian speakers genuinely wanting autonomy because they have been mistreated by the Ukrainian speakers is dismissed, it's also true. 
The Ukrainians do not want a federation. The Russian position is, and by that I mean the Russians, look, Canada has a federation, Quebec speaks its own language, it's okay. But the Ukrainians know that this is only the beginning. I mean, this will lead to devolution. What you do, if you're a Ukrainian, is essentially reach out to the only country that will help you, which is the United States. Uh, last week, you know, 10 days ago, General Hodges, commander of U.S. Army Europe, visited Ukraine. He announced that U.S. trainers would now officially be coming, not just unofficially coming. Uh, he actually pinned medals on Ukrainian fighters, which by protocol of the military is not the way. Foreigners don't get to pin on you know, medals, but he did, showing that this was his army. He then left, and in the Baltics announced that the United States would be pre-positioning armor, artillery, and other equipment in the Baltics, Poland, Romania, and Bulgaria, which is a very interesting point. So the United States, and now to yesterday, the United States announced that it would be sending weapons. Tonight, of course, they denied it, but they are. The weapons will go. Um, in all of this, the United States has acted outside the context of NATO. N because NATO has to have a 100% vote. Any one country can veto anything. And the Turks will veto it just for giggles. <laughs> the, the point is that the United States is prepared to create a cordon sanitaire around Russia. Russia knows it. Russia believes that the United States intends to break the Russian Federation. I think that, as Peter Lorre put it, we don't want to kill you, we just want to hurt you a little bit. <laughs> Either way, uh, we are back at the old game. And if you go ask a Pole or a Hungarian or a Romanian, they live in a totally different universe from a German. And they live in a totally different universe from a Spaniard. So there is no commonality in Europe. But if I were a Ukrainian, I would do exactly what they're doing, try to draw the Americans in. Thank you, Dr. Friedman. In the next hundred years, you sort of correctly predicted, you know, Russian belligerence, and it was sort of, de you know, demographics kind of drives destiny. Uh, you seemed, if, if, as I'm recalling, you seemed less impressed with Western Europe, but you thought Poland, Turkey, and Japan might be countries to watch. You know, it's been roughly a decade since uh, since you published that book. Um, any, are you rethinking any of the predictions or assumptions you made in it? Only that the time frame I expected was, was going to be longer is turning shorter. I, you know, I said in the book that the Ukrainian crisis would blow about 2015. I also said that I expected Russia to begin disintegrating around 2020. I may have given them too much time. Under the current circumstances, the framework of Russia is that the central government collects the money and gives the, the oblasts and the towns money. Under the current circumstance, I'm not sure how much money they can give. We're back at Yeltsin's stance. Now, the thing to remember is in the long run, next three or four years, the Russians may be toast, but they become more dangerous the poorer they are, and they fight better. As a Russian told me, you wouldn't have predicted that we could beat the Wehrmacht from the state of our economy, but we did. You Americans always think of yourself. We don't work that way. We can handle this. I don't think they can handle the full pain that's come on them because I think that oil prices are perpetually going to, is a new normal, but that's another story. However, in looking at the Russians, I don't think they can survive. So, Poland, we've already seen take a much greater role in affairs of Europe, be much more decisive. Turkey has certainly held back its strength. It doesn't want to release it into Syria or Iraq, but it ultimately is going to be it. And Japan remains the major power of uh, East Asia, not China. Uh, Japan's army is capable, larger than the British army, has an excellent air force, and it doesn't have a billion people living in poverty on the level of Bolivia. So I, I don't see any need to change that. 
I'm a bit worried about the timing. That is to say, it may happen faster. The one thing that I'm proudest of is that I did say that the United States would be remain the dominant power and recover the fastest from the, from the 2008. It wasn't 2008 yet, but the meltdown was clearly coming. Essentially, Europe devolved its defense to the United States for 50 years. So what, is, what are the implications in, for the future of European pacifism? Uh, the question of European pacifism, I think, is going to be determined within European countries. That is, the stress within European countries like Belgium, like Italy, like so on. I don't see major international war breaking out except along the fault line between Russia and the European Peninsula. But what I'm struck by is how many secessionist movements have arisen in Europe at this point. And that nothing is more bitter, as Aristotle pointed out, than a civil war. Uh, and that's what I'm afraid of, which is that when I see the Catalonians damning the Castilians, I remember <laughs> what it looked like. No place is really Pacific for very long. I mean, neither the United States, we have constant wars, okay? Europe will, I suspect, not return to the 31 years, but it will return to humanity. They will have their wars, they will have their peace, they will live their lives. It will not be 100 million dead, but the idea of the European exceptionalism, I think, is the one suffering the first death. There will be conflict. There was conflict in Yugoslavia, and there is certainly conflict now in Ukraine. As to the relationship to the United States, we no longer have a relationship with Europe. We have a relationship with Romania, we have a relationship with France. There is no Europe to have a relationship with. Excuse me, um, is, by the way, I'm, subs I'm a subscriber. <coughs> is, Thank you. Uh, is Islamic extremism really the major threat to the United States, and will it die on its own, or will it keep growing? It is a th problem to the United States that is not an existential threat. It has to be dealt with, but it has to be dealt with proportionately. We have other foreign policy interests. So, the primordial interest of the United States, over which for a century we have fought wars, the First, Second Cold War, has been the relationship between Germany and Russia, because united they are the only force that could threaten us, and to make sure that that doesn't happen. I say this as a possible victim of Islamic terrorism, it will happen. Even if we devote all of our efforts to preventing it, we will fail. Therefore, if we do what we did in a decade after 9-11, which is utterly concentrate on that issue to the exclusion of all else, so that our army can't fight unless it has sand under its feet, it's just not used to it, there are much larger dangers to the United States out there. It's very difficult to say to a country that has been hit by 9-11, take it in stride, and no government can. But the discipline of governance is that, while at the same time reassuring people that you're doing everything you can, you make sure you're not. You're making as much as you reasonably should. And our government, we have to remember, the United States is like a 15-year-old. It's manic depressive. In the morning, it is love, peace, love, and happiness at night. It's suicidal because their best friend doesn't like them anymore. We are a very young empire. We don't even want to think about being an empire. We want to go home and, you know, have libertarian dreams. It won't happen. But it takes us a very long time to become mature. George Bush had no idea that his presidency was going to be about 9-11 and had no idea how to respond, and neither did his critics. Barack Obama decided he could wish it all away. If he was nice, they won't try to blow him up. We have to find a pattern of governance that combines an American republic 
with what it never wanted to be. But we're almost one quarter of the world's economy. We are going to piss people off a lot.